Geeks. We're back here with uh, Dr. Pauline's Afterthoughts. That's what he's suggested we call this little <laughs> show. So we haven't gotten anything else, so I think we're going to run with it. I did promise that Pastor Jordan would be here tonight, but unfortunately one of our colleagues happened to get injured in his uh, kids' uh, uh, division here. So she has graciously volunteered to step into the breach with uh, some of the younger kids, so she'll be over there. And for tonight, I've recruited uh, my good friend, Pastor Dan, again to come in here, and we're going to... You're stuck with me. Yeah, we're, we're... Well, I wouldn't put it that way. <laughs> um, and, of course, uh, Dr. Pauline, you're here again. Uh, so, so, John, great message tonight. Me and Dan were both talking about how, uh, you know, excited we are for this conversation. And if I were to sort of summarize, uh, you know, my main takeaway would be... Um, and and this is a pretty old classification within Adventism, right? I think, uh, oh, his name escapes me now. Uh, Hazel, Gerhard mm -hmm. Hazel, came mm -hmm. up with the you know, historical remnant, the faithful remnant, the eschatological remnant. But what I think you brought to the table is, is putting those in a temporal organization. So the historical will be past, um, faithful will be present, eschatological future. I think that's a, a helpful way of looking at it. I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna have to steal that idea if you don't mind. If I may speak to that, sure. um, the interesting thing about it, as far as I know, Gerhard Hazel, uh, who was one of my teachers, mm -hmm. uh, never published that within an Adventist context. As far yeah. as I know, yeah, because uh, when it's referenced, it's referencing a, a non-Adventist encyclopedia right. that he wrote for, mm -hmm. and it was his nephew uh, Frank Hazel mm -hmm. who, studying that and presented it to the committee. And it, for me, it was just like, wow, yeah. you know, that <laughs> is mind-blowing. And perhaps I can understand, maybe back then, uh, Gerhard Hassel felt like this was too explosive mm. for people to handle. Uh, but I think uh, it came out at just the time when we needed it, and, and our whole committee was just amazed at uh, this uh, new perspective on, on the scripture. Yeah, and it's definitely there in the Bible, in my view. Uh, Dan, what did you think? Anything you wanted to, you know, just throw out for our online audience as your as a main takeaway, and you guys can feel free to leave something in the comments yourselves. Go ahead. Dan. Oh yeah, my main takeaway, no question, was this repeated idea that God is up to bigger things than we can ever imagine, and how you showed how that's been happening through history. Like I was thinking as you were speaking, Elijah said, "I'm the only one left." Mm -hmm. No, 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 yeah. no. Yeah, yeah. There's I, a I, lot more. I, I hardly ever preach on the remnant without re referencing that text in Romans. Right? Yeah. It's probably going to be about seven times, seven thousand times, <laughs> or whatever bigger than you think it is. Yeah. If Elijah's experience is anything to go by, right? Yeah. And and we we don't see the path from here to there, so we we have a hard time believing it. Yeah. Yeah. And neither could Elijah. And, and that's okay, right? Um, it's part of our human experience to have limited perspective. Yeah. And that means that we can let God work, right? Mm -hmm. And and be awed at what he does. Yes. Um, anything you wanted to just leave the people with here just as we get underway? Are, are we capturing your, your sermon well? Anything you want to add again or, you know, just throw it as well, your... Well, your Dan was saying something just before that I thought was significant. Maybe you want to share that? And yeah, let's go into that, Dan. Yeah, ask, so your, ask your question. <clears throat> so for a while now, I've been listening to a series of podcasts on cults and look, trying to look at the common denominators and what makes these things thrive and go on. And the one major common denominator is that all of their leaders say, you know, we have this thing, and if you join us and believe this thing, then you're in, and if you're not, you're out. And do you think that Adventism, either corporately or within the rank and file, have somewhat fallen into that mentality of we have this special thing, and because we have it, we're in, and everybody else is in. And, and by in, I think you mean here, like, existentially, right? Like, if, if you're not in, then you're going to, you know, have, something terrible is going to happen to you, right? Yeah. Like, that's sort of the idea, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think it actually would be surprising if we didn't fall into that. And I, I could look back many times in my own past and, and, and having that kind of thought uh, as well. It happened with Israel. Uh, you know, we've got the temple, so nothing could possibly go wrong. Mm. And the prophets are coming in and say, whoa, 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 uh, don't get so stuck on yourself. Um, what is religion? Ultimately, religion is a human response to a mighty act of God. Mm. And people sense God is here, God has done something amazing, and they create a structure to honor what God did mm. and to share it with the world. And that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful thing. The problem is that over time religions tend to get stuck on their own existence and lose touch with the original vision. So God keeps moving yeah. and we fail to move with him. Exactly, you see. 
And so I think, I think the message for me in all of this is to, on the one hand, honor the church, yeah. delight in the church. The church fed me. Yeah. I went through seminary and all of that. I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for the church. The church has done amazing things for me. At the same time, it's a human organization with flaws. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And our kids see it so clearly. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to get anywhere with the kids by saying, you know, well, you should change your eyesight. Right. Mm -hmm. We're more likely to get somewhere with the kids if we just say, you know, as a church, we failed. As a parent, I failed. Right. And uh, you know, I'm sorry about that, but I'm flawed, just like you. And together, let's let's try to make a difference. Let's change all that. Mm. I think it's interesting that you bring in the kids because, as you were saying that, I was thinking of developmental dynamics and how difficult it can be to achieve that kind of adult to adult relationship with your parents. That's really important for yeah. like a you know a healthy middle age, you know, and going yeah. into senior years, right? Um, and how therefore also important it is to achieve an adult to adult relationship with the church because Jesus said we're not supposed to have spiritual daddies here on earth mm -hmm. you know the church is not my spiritual mommy as it yeah. is in some other religions I need to achieve an adult adult relationship with my church and that means not being perpetually in either a state of childish uh, subservience or adolescent rebellion against the church mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. And then I also thought about us as church leaders, right? How to bring people into an adult adult relationship with the church, you know, and, and let them go through those phases of childhood, adolescence, and spiritual maturity. I don't know. Uh, your, your comments really prompted reflection. Oh, there. definitely. I mean, I think of Ephesians 4, where Paul mm -hmm. is saying the purpose of all the spiritual gifts mm -hmm. is to grow the church to maturity. Right to an adult way of thinking. Jesus said, unless you become a child, you won't enter the kingdom. He doesn't say you won't stay in the kingdom. <laughs> All right? Yeah. We, may, we need to be a child to enter the kingdom, but yeah. then he wants us to grow up right. and, and, uh, and become adults because God wants to engage us in an adult level. Yeah. And, and the more we can grow, the more God will enjoy us yeah. and, and, and enjoy relationship with us. I mean, that's, that, that's amazing to me. I think, you know, 30, 40 years ago, I never anticipated how important it would be to me as I grew older that my kids would be in the faith. Yeah. And my heart goes out to any of you watching this program where, where you, you feel like you're losing your kids. Yeah. Uh, I remember once I was speaking to a room full of pastors and sharing the differences between generations and how that impacts our own young people in the way they relate to their parents and to the church. Mm -hmm. And I had six of those pastors, one by one, separately, come to me during that week, break down and cry, and said, I've ruined my children. Mm. What do I do? Mm. And to each one I said, an apology mm. would be a good start. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you have ruined your kids, it's not the end of the world. But you're not going to rebuild that relationship without acknowledging where you've fallen short and committing with them together uh, to grow back together as a family and, and as believers in, in Christ. Mm. So, Amen. you know, that, the, the fact that, that my kids are uh, self-generating, whatever you call it, uh, Christians who of their own choice yeah. means so much to me. Amen. And my heart goes out to anyone who, who hasn't had that experience. And uh, I pray that God will, will help you to see where the barrier is and to the degree that you can to, uh, to bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. uh, the best uh, book I've ever seen on that was actually written in 1975. And it's called Path to the Heart by Glenn Kuhn. It's how to witness to your family members with whom you have a tense relationship regarding religion. Hmm. Never seen a better book on that, even though it's more than 50 years old. Somebody's got it on Amazon, so you should be able to find it. Hmm. Uh, that book, just, uh, just amazing, uh, how it, it hits right to the core of where the problems are in such a relationship. Well, let's shift gears maybe and talk about, um, you know, as far as, you know, we, we were talking about, you know, how do we retain people within God's remnant movement? What about the time when, you know, all these folks come in that uh, we, we just can't even anticipate? Um, when you were preaching on that, I was thinking about 
there being two different ways to kill an organization. Uh, because people think that it's it's decline that kills an organization, but it's really it's really the rate of growth or decline that kills an organization. Mm -hmm. Right? An organization can survive if it declines slowly. Mm -hmm. Right? It can also survive if it grows slowly. But shrink it or grow it too quickly, that's what can really blow things up. Right? <laughs> and I, I'm, yeah. I've been thinking about recently about our church structure and, and how would it survive a rapid influx of people into the Seventh Day Adventist movement. Mm -hmm. Even should it survive, right? It, it certainly couldn't survive, I think, in its current form, because we are, I don't think, currently organized for rapid growth. And that's not a knock on the organization. That's just the nature of most organizations, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if if we if we grew by more than you know 15% a year, uh, if, if that that would become very uh, a very difficult challenge to manage and. I don't see us as, as a Seventh-day Adventist Church organization positioning ourselves for that kind of thing. But we do have some examples, and uh, one that would jump out to me is Brazil, mm. uh, which by far is the most Adventist country in the world in the sense of, of sheer numbers. Yes. I think we're talking millions. The right. uh, United States has a million or so. Brazil is probably double that. Right. Uh, and uh, rapid, rapid growth. and. Mm -hmm. I have found Brazil to be the most dynamic country I've been to in terms of Adventism. And yes, the, and the, it is. That the young people are passionate about it, but they're not closed-minded either. Yeah. Mm. And they're able to engage the world without mm -hmm. throwing away their own faith. I, I'm, I'm very impressed uh, with that. So it is yeah. possible yeah. Uh, to grow rapidly and, uh, and still maintain that cohesion and that uh, spiritual uh, thing. But, you know, Brazil has its struggles as well. Mexico, southern Mexico is another place where the church almost doubled uh, every year for quite a while. Yeah. And uh, that had tremendous excitement and, of course, also brings its challenges. Right, right. Can but I, here, here in North America, it seems like we're just not ready. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, let me jump in with a question that relates. <clears throat> so you talked about the historic remnant today being historic Adventism mm -hmm. and the present remnant being Adventists who are faithful to that package of beliefs. And that the future remnant is a big thing that God's going to do that we can't anticipate. So given that, what should we be doing, could we be doing to position ourselves yeah. now since we don't necessarily know what he's going to do? <laughs> well, you know, I have to say as a pastor giving Bible studies, one of the things that always disappointed me, it never seemed to fail, that I'd sit down with somebody after a few weeks, they would excitedly tell me one day, because of you, I'm a better Catholic than I was before. Because of you, I'm a better Lutheran than I was before. And so, I, and I was kind of disappointed. And I'm rethinking that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't that, it, with the remnant concept, if each of these bodies is in some way corporately, uh, still has a, a message that God can use. Right. All right. Even though it's flawed, even though it's uh, mixed messages at best, that there's still some things God can use. Uh, if the faithful remnant within each of those entities are those who really grasped what those bodies could and should have been, yeah. uh, is that not a big step forward? Yes. If at some point God brings together this larger remnant of kindred spirits, they'll be part of it. You know, see. So I, I, I'm not as disappointed as I used to be. I, I know eventually many of them will, will advance uh, in truth and in, uh, beyond that, et cetera. But, but realizing maybe that was not a failure, but it was simply God restoring a faithful remnant that, uh, that maybe wasn't always there. So second follow-up question. Do you think it's possible? I said last night I'm blogging through Matthew. Do you think it's possible that we will be as out of step with the big thing God does as the disciples were out of step with what Jesus was trying to do when he was here. Sadly, I suppose it could happen. You know, um, Again, if you take the biblical models, uh, the big biblical model was Israel. Mm -hmm. And they studied the prophecies. Mm -hmm. They were careful in their diet. Yeah. They paid tithes. They kept the Sabbath from sundown to sundown. Yeah. I mean, they were as good Adventists as you could get. Mm -hmm. They looked forward to the coming of the Messiah, you sure. see. 
And yet, Jesus didn't quite fit their picture of the future. Mm -hmm. God was doing something bigger and different than they anticipated, and as a result of that, many rejected him. So if you, how do I say this delicately? If you are overly certain about what God is going to do in the future. Yeah. And by the way, 2,000 years of history, if you read Froome's Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, yeah. uh, those who predict the future on the basis of their study of the Bible have usually been wrong, yeah. at least in part. Yeah. Uh, so that should humble us to say, the future is still in God's control, not mine. Mm. And I may know a lot of things about the future from prophecy, but history tells me that knowing the future in advance uh, is still a dicey proposition, even with prophecy. And so a little bit of humility, uh, a little bit of uncertainty is probably a healthy thing so that when the real thing comes, you'll be open to the possibility that God would be working here and not just close your mind. That couldn't be God because it's supposed to happen this way. Mm. That's the pattern I see in history, and we're not immune to that. Uh, just as the Pharisees rejected Jesus because he didn't fit their scenario, I fear that if our scenario is too carefully laid out, we might make the same mistake. When the real thing happens, we're looking in another direction. I think we have to be mindful of that. And that brings us back to the topic of, uh, I think, the previous night. We really do need the gospel, right? Mm -hmm. It's not about our faithfulness. It's about God's faithfulness to us. Yeah. And then we respond to that. Yeah. So, you know, we can't, you know, rest comfortably on our biblical interpretations, our prophetic interpretations, our remnant status in the remnant trajectory, any of that sort of thing, and say, well, now we've, we're ready to go, right? It's God's faithfulness. And so we have to leave the door open for God to do what he does best, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think on that point, we could conclude. But would you like to leave us with a last word, John? Well, let's keep looking forward together. And uh, remnant is a real possibility for each of us. Amen. It has multiple dimensions. Yeah. And uh, what God is going to do with us is not totally visible yet. So mm. let's look forward to that. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you very much. Right. Good night, everybody. We'll see you again tomorrow. And God bless you all.